pressing needs and also identify the solutions required to save and sustain lives and to recover from crisis. And despite a lot of talk about localization, we know that only a small fraction of funding goes directly to local actors worldwide. In Sudan specifically, funding to local actors has been minuscule for the scale of crisis and the enormous needs, and CORE is working to change that. We're the first organization to support local actors to deliver multi-purpose cash assistance and group cash transfers in Khartoum. We are a connector between donors and community-based organizations, and as a facilitator, we help unregistered, emerging, self-mobilizing, mutual aid community groups to access the financial services they need to sustain their activities and to expand the work that they've started from the first day after the crisis. We provide training and coaching to help community groups be ready to take on greater resources. And we also uh, support them to provide new services to address service gaps. The group cash transfer approach is recognized as a best practice by the Cash Learning Partnership Network, among others. And it does not replace individual or household level assistance, but it's to complement those. Community groups design the interventions they know are needed and that they are uniquely positioned to deliver. The fund is, excuse me, the funds are modest. This might be 500 to 10,000 US dollars per group, depending on the context, but these funds go a long way with great impact. This resource transfer to groups is paired with training to strengthen capacities and coach on project management, narrative and financial reporting, monitoring and evaluation to complement the existing capacity. Next slide, please. CORE and NIDA have supported to date 11 out of the nearly 100 women's response rooms across Sudan. In Khartoum, the women's response rooms led, led activities to support women and children, addressing their nutrition, protection, psychosocial, sexual and reproductive health, and health needs. These activities were not only a continuation of what the women's response rooms were already doing, but also an expansion of new services available for women and children in these communities. And in each locality, the women's response rooms received a group cash transfer amounting between 500 and 8,000 US dollars. This varied based on the activities that they set out to deliver. And we saw remarkable impacts uh, under the leadership of the women's response rooms. These impacts included safe relocation of survivors of gender-based violence and individuals at risk out of harm's way, safe birth for women and their babies who needed support to reach clinics for life-saving procedures, uh, operations and medication, access to safe spaces and psychosocial support for women, girls, and boys, and access to food through the communal kitchens. We've seen great complementarity between the group cash transfer approach and household level multi-purpose cash assistance as an equalizer for those who are most marginalized to address their basic needs and to support their protection and well-being amidst the ongoing crisis. This is particularly clear when it comes to addressing gaps in services for women and children who we know are the most impacted by the crisis while also having the least access to and control over resources. Next slide, please. So what did it take for us to operationalize group cash transfers in Khartoum? Recognizing and building trust with the emergency response rooms, the women's response rooms and NGOs like NIDA is critical. Their local leadership, knowledge, expertise, and insights were the breakthroughs needed to be able to deliver the first cash assistance in Khartoum. We need to acknowledge and then push through the logistical challenges of getting funds to local partners. For example, we experienced delays with intermediary bank audits, and one way we overcame this was helping local partners become familiar with interna international banking codes, so we tackled this uh, from both sides to try to mitigate delays. CORE and other INGOs need to backstop local partners. We can support with training, coaching, and flexibility. Accountability is key, as I just stressed, uh, but bending, we need to bend the arc of expectations away from heavy requirements towards what's feasible for the emergency response rooms and the WRRs. And this requires flexibility uh, with our procedures as well as our formats. The ERRs and the WRs have shown in their partnership with CORE and NIDA that they can deliver financial and narrative reporting with some pointers on data quality and patience in the face of ongoing connectivity issues. CORE and other INGOs play an important intermediary role. Uh, we can help broker flexibility needed from donors to help facilitate resource transfers, to support accountability, and to help amplify the lessons learned with the, which the ERRs and WRs are sharing with institutional donors and with other actors in the traditional humanitarian system. Betsy, over to you. Great. Thanks so much, Tenzin.
So our opening speaker did such a good job of really setting the tone for today's discussion, particularly around the impactful and community-led response work that's underway. The effectiveness of the ERRs and WRRs have inspired many of us, but it does beg the question, what can international NGOs do and how can we best support without undermining this incredible movement? We put our heads together and came up with a few ideas. Um, particularly, we can research, re-envision, and redesign how we work with community-led movements. This includes socializing and sharing our best practices, but remaining constantly agile. Not learning, not, not demanding all of our nice to haves and finding ways um, to really make aid more efficient in its distribution. For example, embracing things like group cash transfer, a non-traditional way of working for us. We can assume risk. Uh, during a momentous ERR envoy to New York and DC in late January, the message to INGOs was very clear. Unless there's a greater threshold for risk and risk sharing among international actors, lives will be unnecessarily lost. Donors and many of our peer NGOs continue to be stuck in the quicksand of compliance and have been largely apprehensive and sluggish to deliver on our commitments, particularly to localization in Sudan. As underscored by the Sudan Cash Consortium, we can collectively adopt and demand donor support cash first approach as a key market driven multi sectoral pillar of the humanitarian response in Sudan. This becomes especially critical as we see the barriers that organizations are facing in delivering in kind aid and assistance. We can do internal advocacy within our own respective INGOs, pushing our own leadership to look at what's happening in Sudan, to invest what we can of our own unrestricted funds, using our own unrestricted investments to bridge critical gaps as we wait for more significant um, commitments from ODA to come through. We can use our own organizational platforms to raise awareness amongst our own supporters, creating space to amplify voices and articulate needs, all while protecting the anonymity and safety of the frontline workers who are assuming massive risk as they work on the response. And we can jointly advocate for significant investment in funding. Josh shared at the beginning that we have a very small percentage of the Sudan appeal met, um, and the time has come for INGOs to come together and jointly demand full investment in the Sudan response. So Josh, over to you. I know we will be sharing a more formal call to action from CGI and the folks on this call later in the week. So stay tuned. Excellent, Betsy, and thanks to CORE. I think demonstrating a really good flow of how this, how this works in practice. Um, to talk a bit more about sort of the emergency and development nexus and some really creative technology and agriculture food security focused programming is Simongani Kayola from Mercy Corps. Welcome. Thank you, Josh. Um, 